This is Nicole Sauce from the Holler Homestead giving you a woman's take on the walk towards independence because we're living free in Tennessee. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Today is Monday, March 13, 2017, and this is episode 27 of Living Free in Tennessee. And today we are going to talk about what not to do when you first move to your new homestead or farm, or really any piece of land where you think you might want to do something to increase your self reliance. These are three things I really wish we had known before we dove into our project here at the Holler Homestead. And we will also share with you some of the stories along the way in our first couple years, which you may not yet have heard. Also today, we will go over a brand new gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free potluck recipe that I made up this weekend without buying anything from the store, because I had a request for a gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free dish. And those kind of requests come up a lot, and sometimes it just makes you end up a little stymied about what to do. I've got some updates to also share about the Holler Homestead progress, and we really will go over Toby Hemingway's eighth eighth chapter in Gaia's Garden. Thanks for bearing with me on that one. It took me a while to think about it, and that's probably a good thing, although sometimes for me that's the point in the book where I walk away and throw my hands up, but I'm glad I stuck it through. Anyway, if you have a comment or want to drop me an email, shoot it over to NicoleSauce at gmail.com or drop your thoughts over at our website, livingfreeintennessee.com. And you know what? We have been talking to some really awesome people who make some homemade stuff about adding their products to our Buy Stuff page. I'm not sure it will really happen, although the person also helped me brainstorm the recipe that's gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free. But... If it does happen, you will soon have access to one of the best, most refreshing handcrafted lip balms I have ever tried. So keep your ears tuned for that announcement soon, I hope. And by the way, handcrafting person, if you're listening, we do need to finish that conversation. Anyway, a little different than our last few episodes, I thought I would break up some of our standard segments a little bit because I realized that... Gosh, we were getting half an hour into the show before I started the show, which seems a bit long. So today we're going to do a few of our usual segments up front, go into the meat of the podcast, and then do a few of our regularly scheduled segments at the end. This gives some of our new listeners, I think, a chance to decide if they like the content. And, uh, you know, if you're not hearing from week to week all of the updates, sometimes they don't make the most sense. So first up, we'll go over eating seasonally and tales from the prepper pantry. This is where we share what we're eating as it comes to us and talk about ways to use what we store. And this week is a lot like last week. Uh, we've got mild, wild mustard greens growing everywhere, and I did not expect them this early. I've got to be honest. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because we have a kind of a fun little weather thing happening right now where it's been beautiful for weeks. And then we got snow, and now it's going to be 21 degrees, and the peach trees are blooming, which means they're probably not going to set fruit. And I'm kind of harsh about this. I'm not going to go throw sheets over those trees. I've got a different variety of peach that is not blooming yet, and that's where I'm hoping to get some fruit. We also have our usual wild salad. The watercress is going strong, and this this uh, cooling segment right now is going to probably make the watercress last a bit longer. We are going to start harvesting our dandelion roots to dry. And the reason I'm doing it now is I now can see where they are because they've got the little baby spring leaves, which are so good on a salad. And that just uh, makes it so it's easier for me to find them. I always hear that you should harvest them in the winter. I usually harvest them about now. And then this week, we're also going to go get some sassafras root for sassafras tea. We are, though, getting our usual weather smack down. It seems like every year in Tennessee when we have a a relatively mild, warm winter, we turn the corner for spring. Everybody gets their spring clothes out of the closet, puts their winter stuff away, and then bam, snow. Bam, 21 degrees, 15 degrees, something like that. And that's, you know, this year is no different than any other. Apparently, this particular weather pattern is pushing down for Canada, so... Thanks to our friends in the north, we will be having uh, some interesting changes here. I'm very glad I didn't 
I didn't give in to any temptations to put seeds in the ground that were way too early to put them or transplant any plants out into the garden just yet. Now, this week... I wanted to share with you a prepper pantry recipe that you may not have tried before. As I said last week, the garlic is getting ready to dry. That means that it's thinking about turning and we don't want it to turn, but we want to still use it. So last week I went through and looked at it. Some of it's still really good. Some of it had to be tossed out and some of it will be dried. I'd grind it up, dry it, as I said, and then powder it as I need it. However, It's also a really good excuse to do something yummy. And what I'm going to do this week is make a nice crusty loaf of bread. And then we're going to take those cloves of garlic. I'll probably do about two cups of cloves. So that's, you know, I don't know how many heads that is. That could be 15 heads of garlic for all I know. It depends on how big the teeth are on the cloves. I'm going to put them in to a pot that's covered with butter. Now, you can do this with olive oil. I like it with butter. That's just how I am. I'm going to throw it in the oven at 350 degrees and slow bake that all sealed up so that the juices stay in it. And we cook them for, you know, between 25 and 35 minutes, depending on how long it takes for them to become nice and soft and infused with that butter. Then we stir it all up and it becomes one of the best spreads I've ever had. Now you can add salt and pepper to that. You could add another flavor like dill or basil. That would be pretty good. Just add dried at the end. But this garlic spread is coming out this week, which means nobody's going to want to stand near me next week, which is good because I'm going camping, come to think of it, really soon. And mosquitoes also are reputed not to like garlicky people very much. And I am a, a mosquito magnet most of the time. So that's our roasted garlic spread. There is, you know... I don't know if you've really tried many garlic things. Another way to do this is to just take one head of garlic, like a big head of elephant garlic works really well with this. And don't even peel it. You just take off the dirty parts. You slice the very top of the the head of garlic off so that you can see the garlic in there and you, you drizzle olive oil or butter over that and salt and pepper. And you either encase that in in tin foil or you put it in a garlic roasting sealed container and you basically do the the same thing I said and then you can pull off each individual clove of garlic and just squeeze that on your bread it's really good I'm just taking that recipe or that approach and putting it on crack to end up with a lot more garlic spread because I have a lot of surplus garlic right now and it's time to use it up especially since I'm pretty sure garlic scape season is going to come a little early, but we'll talk about that when it comes. Now, I did promise you at the very beginning of the show to share with you my gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free potluck dish. That's right. I was asked to help coordinate the feeding of a large group of people, and anytime you have a large group of people, there are any number of allergies. And there was one person that had those three allergies, and then I noticed that all the other allergies basically fell into one of those three categories. So I thought, well, let's just make one dish that they can all eat so we're not making individual dishes for each allergy. It makes it a lot easier. And this was also happening at a time when I had eight people helping with the potluck to feed 60 people. And usually we have 20 or 30 people who will bring something, so that makes it a lot easier. So we just, we pulled the pizza, pizza party card friend of mine got a bunch of pizzas for four bucks each which are not gluten-free dairy-free or soy-free in all intents and purposes it's usually there's soy in there if there's any vegetable oil used in anything because most vegetable oil blends have soy you'd be surprised when you start looking at where soy is I have a soy allergy myself it's in everything and the reason I volunteered for the task of the gluten-free dairy-free soy-free thing was that I do have an allergy. I know how sick you can get if it's a bona fide allergy. I didn't think they were making it up. And I thought, well, we'll just go f- go with it, right? So I looked around and I had a talk with some friends over on the TSP Zello channel. And they had lots of good ideas. There was a, in fact, I'm going to try this recipe this week, a sweet potato paleo chili dish. So it's like sweet potatoes and ground stuff and spices. And you just bake that all down. So it's bean free which means it's soy free. That sounded really good, but I was kind of busy this weekend and didn't want to mess with it. Or there was also like, 
ground venison over vegetables with mushroom sauce sounded really yummy and I could do a pretty good mushroom gravy without any problem. Lots of wild mushrooms are dried here right now, so we're we're good to go in the mushroom department. And then I looked at the pile of eggs that I needed to process. You see, we have been selling egg shares. I just sold two dozen duck eggs today. And we are, you know, like it's starting to pick up as the word gets out, but it's very hard when you have poultry, when they reach their peak laying to have all of the dozens of eggs sold immediately. And so I have had a bit of a surplus egg collection and I thought, you know, this is the perfect time for me to use up some of those eggs that we are not eating as fast as I would like. And then I won't have to freeze them or think of something else to do with them. Because they were kind of, they're, they're something where I probably wouldn't sell them because they were about a week old. But I would use them. I'd serve them to people. Week old eggs are perfectly fine. It's just when you sell something to somebody at a premium price, then you want to make sure they have a premium product. So I cracked about 14 duck eggs into a bowl and whisk those up real good with some dill powder and some oregano and some salt. That's that's the spices. So I just had those dried in my um, in my pantry, of course. And then I sliced up some ham that we made that I had in the freezer. Just took it out, defrosted it, cubed it up. And then I went out to the watercress patch and I harvested a bunch of watercress. And this is the funny thing about watercress is, you know, like any green, when you cook it down, it really cooks down. So I put about six cups of diced watercress into a hot cast iron skillet and I sauteed it with coconut oil. So sauteed that all up put it in the bottom of a casserole dish, put the ham chunks in the bottom of the casserole dish, poured the whipped up egg scrambly stuff in there, put it covered in the oven at 350 degrees for about 40 minutes. Uh, it may have been 30. I'm not exactly sure. So till it was done is, is the answer to that question. 40 was about right just for the amount I had. And here's what happened. When I put it in the casserole dish, there was about an inch and a half of liquid over all of the stuff, and the stuff was at the bottom. And over the course of cooking, I guess duck eggs behave a little differently than chicken eggs. I've noticed that they have more rising power. Well, my my word, this thing ended up a, a two and a half times as tall <laughs> as the eggs I put in. So I was really glad. I was kind of going for a, you know, an inch thick quiche looking thing. Um, I called it a frittata. It's more of a frittata. Uh, and what I ended up with was more of a casserole dish thick pie like thing. And I served that and it was, there was like two bites left at the end of it. So apparently they liked it. I didn't even taste the thing before I served it. Like that's how confident I was. It would taste good. And it was really good. Now Mark told me that he would rather have had it with some grated cheese on the top. And I looked at him and I said, that does not make it dairy free. And he said, oh, good point. So, you know, if, if you don't need to be gluten free, dairy free and soy free, then use this recipe, please, on with some cheese in it. It's really good. And it was super easy to make. The reason I made it is it took me five minutes to put those things together. And then it just baked itself and I was ready to go and it looked like I'd put some effort into something. So I love dishes like that. And of course, if you don't have a watercress patch in your backyard, just, you know, use spinach, use something else, use a green that you do have, use some vegetables. Make sure if you're going to do like broccoli or something, though, uh, do pre-cook it because you want it nice and soft. That's why I pre-cooked the watercress. Anyway, next we have getting the gardens ready. This is where we share what we're doing to get our food growing operation up and running for the 2017 growing season. And this week, instead of working much on the gardens, we worked really hard on what we call Operation Eyesore. Operation Eyesore happens every spring here at the Holler Homestead. Sometimes it happens in the fall too. And it's it's when we go around and look at everything that's been left in the yard because it was too cold. Like, you know, I, I feed the ducks, I feed them sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds come in bags. It's 14 degrees outside and raining and I get to the end of a bag and I kind of stick it somewhere where I will go back and get it and throw it away someday because I don't want to run to the other side of the property. Yeah, so you know how that can go, right? Or like 
this whole thing where the ducks were escaping and I put up fences everywhere. I have random fences around my yard that need to be moved. And really, we never, never really addressed some of our overgrown areas. Usually we'll go back through with the weed whacker after the weeds have died and make sure they're all folded over and mulching back into the ground. So Operation Eyesore happened big time this weekend. It was really fun. We're also working on the final bed preparation. And it'll probably take me another two to three weeks to get this ready. And some of those are places where I plant things later. But it's really just about... It, I am fighting the Johnson grass, guys. So I'm pulling out as much of Johnson grass slash Johnson grass root that I can. And then making sure the beds are nice and mulched with duck poop and chicken poop and then covering that with wood cheap chips and just letting it perk down now i know some people are kind of sketchy about that in their gardens i've never had a problem with it people like freak out oh the nitrogen overload that's hot poop well it's not like i'm putting it straight on the roots of a plant i'm putting it somewhere where yes i have chickweed and i have dead nettle there right now but I'm not trying to keep those necessarily alive and it d certainly does not eradicate them they come back every year so it works fine we are using the deep litter method in both of our coops which means they've been composting for a while and there might be one or two little poops that are fresher and it's not like I'm not like spraying it on the leaves of my leafy greens right so I just put it in there and I do let it sit for usually six weeks or so before I plant in it Although this year it's going to be more like four weeks, it looks like, uh, in the in the later in the beds that are are done later, and then I'll probably set up one area where I just pile the rest of it so I can it can finish composting down for the next round of nutrient packing in my garden, and then also we're. I, I talked about this a few weeks ago. The blackberry propagation is happening right now. I, I got one single thornless blackberry plant last year and I just put it in the ground with a comfrey plant in the corner of my garden near the fence and I was pretty excited about the thornless aspect of this just because I, I have you'll see what I'll get I'll put a picture up online when the wild raspberries are going and the blackberries are going what my arms usually look like even though I try really hard not to get thorned I get thorned every time I, I, I look like I've been in a massive cat fight like literally cats not like girl girl cat fight but you know cats so we're going to bend. I've got three really good stalks coming off that plant right now. Bending them over, burying them in the dirt, making sure that they have a good opportunity to root so that I end up with three or four blackberry plants going into next year. And we'll just keep doing that every year. Once, once I have a good root, probably in the fall, I'll move them. That's when I've usually done it. If it's not looking like it's quite ready to move, I'll let it go through the winter. And then next spring, we'll dig it up and move them a little further apart because the cool thing about propagating blackberries this way is it's basically no work you just bend the stalk over let it root and move it far apart so that you can bend the next stalks over the next year and let them root and in, in that way you end up with a lot of plants for free so you know when i bought this single plant from the person i think they were a little disappointed i only bought one but i was like you know what, you have one blackberry plant, you have a million blackberry plants. Those things are some of the easiest plants to propagate that I know of. And then I wanted to share our seedling light update. I remember going into this year saying I would not do lights again this year. I usually raise my seedlings without lights um, and just deal with the fact that early in the season they get a little leggy. But this time... I, after starting the seedlings, I was like, you know what? This light is really cheap. I'll give it a go. And man, my tomato starts are dark, dark green. They look great. So if you can afford to do your lighting, like I'm a convert. Like I, you can make it happen without. There's like no reason to break the bank or go into debt over getting a light. But whew, totally happy with how that's gone. And now it's the moment you've all been waiting for, the main topic of today's show, which is three mistakes to avoid on your new land or farm or homestead or anything. These are the three things that I just wanted to go over with you that you might want to think about as you embark on your new adventure. Is it something in the air? So many people are changing their jobs, home, or even starting a new business that it seems like it's something in the air. And some of you have shared with me new directions that you're going to take. 
Some of you have a 10-year plan. Some of you are literally going to fly out in the morning to go pick up your family and move on to your next adventure. I got to say, my favorite time to work on any business is during the initial phase. It's during this time right now. And it's, it's why I spent so many years working with startup companies back in my corporate days. But when you're talking about lands, farms, or a homestead, that's a totally different thing. When you start up some sort of virtual business that's not heavily manufacturing based, things can be very flexible. If one revenue model is not working, for example, it's pretty easy to quickly adjust to the needs of your audience. And with a farm, uh, some decisions that you make today may be with you for years and years and years. I mean, Okay, over the weekend, I finally fixed a problem I created with the installation of a retaining wall that has been my problem. It's been a problem ever since I installed it for six years. And it's partially because I made some mistakes that I'm sharing with you below that this stuck with me for six years. And that's six years of bad productivity on that part of my land because I could not remedy the situation. I did not have the resources or bandwidth. So, if you are about to embark on your homesteading adventure this year, why why don't we just talk about what not to do rather than, you know, I'm always talking like six tips on your new homestead. Let's talk about what not to do because I think sometimes what not to do is as important as what to do. Now, I know everyone out there is probably telling you do this, do that, do that, do the other thing, and it's often conflicting. And I'm hoping that if you can also apply the lens of what not to do, it'll help you figure out what works for you. Because the truth of the matter is different things work for different people and different properties. Over the years here at the Holler Homestead, we've had plenty of time to think about what we shouldn't have done, as well as time to plan about what we want to do. And then sometimes not even do that because we realize, huh, turns out we're not really into that after all. So some things that we did here, like adding the deck that to the ruined wasteland to the front of our house because when we moved in it looked like a cruise missile had hit the front of the house that was probably a mistake maybe but it was pretty much unavoidable because how was I to know that a greenhouse was supposed to go there I didn't know that for a year and I wasn't about to spend a year like crawling over a whole bunch of broken cinder blocks and stuff just to get to my front door and what you know what most people have in front of their houses are patios and decks. So that's what we built. And then I kind of, you know, as I figured out how this house was designed with a giant south facing wall that's 12 inches thick and filled with sand and it's stone for several of those inches. And it was painted a dark color. Like the clues were there, but it took me a while to figure out what was going on with the whole passive solar design of the front of our house. And other things like the overtilling that we did, the location of the pig roasting pit and the bonfire area, those could have been planned much differently had we avoided these three common mistakes. So here they are. One, don't rush in. Two, don't do everything at once. And three, don't underestimate. I want to dive into each one a little bit. I'll give you a few examples and then hopefully you can use that as you're planning your new adventure. It takes time. So one, don't rush in. It takes time to learn your land, your farm, your homestead. If if there's already infrastructure in place, rather than redo it, get to know what's there. Try to use it. See how it works. Sometimes something that seems like it's in a really stupid place, sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's in a stupid place for a really good reason and it turns out it's not so stupid. So when I say don't rush in, I mean take some time to get to know your land. Major changes are absolutely fine, but you want to ensure that you're clear on what you want out of your new project or your new piece of land and why. So, you know, maybe you can go in and say, you know what? Yep, building a house right there because this is how it's all going to work together. And yeah, that makes sense if you're moving to a piece of land that has nothing on it, but you want to think really carefully about where that is and how it fits into your overall long-term plan for the house. As I said, in our first year, we built a deck, right? Because we needed to be able to walk in and out of the house. We fixed the plumbing in the house. We remodeled the bathroom. We added wood heat to the house. We built a pig pit and we roasted a pig. That was a really fun party. We began to remodel the guest cabin. We repaired the septic system. We put in a garden. We started raising chickens. Do you hear how long this list is getting? 
You know what we didn't do? We didn't spend very much time trying to figure out and learn how the pump house works, how to make sure our water system down there was secure against winter, which it was not, where the plumbing goes in the house once it, like we totally ignored a major part of what it takes just to maintain a house. And, and I think it's really important when you come into your homestead, when you choose, you know, for, for the person out there, for Dory, uh, you, you're moving into a property with multiple living options from what I understand. So when you choose which one you're starting with that you're gonna stay at, like you wanna go through and audit the electrical the plumbing? Where does the water come from? Where does it go to? Are all of those systems working well? Is there heat? If there's not heat, how do I get heat? Is there cooling? Do I need cooling? I think it's really important to look at those basic things before you jump into building a pig pit in your first year, which was an unnecessary but very fun addition. I I could have spent all the time I was spending stacking those cinder blocks together and building the the rack for the pig, I could have totally spent that time in the pump house. And that would have alleviated what turned into three or four years of the great battle against the frozen pipes, which I think I might actually have won by now. And then remember to take a moment to look around and observe what is there. You, you're going to see, I mean, if you go through with a bush hog and just whack everything down because that's the standard, you may not notice some really cool wild plants that might there uh, be there. You might, in fact, I just found out, this is really cool on, on this topic. Next door, there's a property next door where some homesteaders lived years ago. And recently I've come into contact with somebody who knew them pretty well. And she told me where their asparagus was. And if, if I had bought that property and been mowing that area the whole time, there wouldn't be a chance that the asparagus is still there. Right now, I haven't gone to look yet, but we might have asparagus down at the bottom of the hill in this patch. And I did do know that, you know, the watercress is probably here be because of them. Like, they help make that happen. So, you know, take a moment, look around and observe what you have that might not be obvious. You may have some interesting microclimates. You may have an area of your property that never freezes and then you may want to think about why that is or you might have some buildings that are gems in the rough i i <laughs> this is funny so we had a workshop on our property when we got here and it was full of stuff and it was kind of an i can't even situation so we'd go down there from time to time to look for pieces and parts but we didn't really look at it thoroughly in part because the time of year we moved in the the brush was so high so I was really well situated to learn all the wild plants in my yard because they were all there uh, but in the fall we discovered on the back side of our workshop that there was a chicken coop or a duck coop as a, I think it was ducks originally we turned it into a chicken coop so we had animal housing built in and if we hadn't taken the time to wait and see what was there, I don't think we would, I think we would have built a whole brand new chicken coop, which we didn't have to, like, that was a, that was one thing that went well, right? Okay, so that's the first thing. Don't rush in. Second, don't do everything at once. I've told you everything we did in our first year, and I mean, on that list, some of it needed to happen, but the pig pit did not need to be built, right? We didn't really need to start remodeling the guest cabin, it probably would have been better to concentrate on making our primary living location livable. We did need to work on the pump house. Uh, I'm not sure we needed a garden, but that didn't take that much time that first year. And I don't know, we just kind of, we got a lot of things started at once and didn't finish most of them for a very long time. So when you're going into the new project, you're going to end up with this list. And I think the key here is to write down everything you want to do, but then have a good talk with your husband or wife or partner or whoever's out there with you about what your true priority is. Is it having a decent place to live? Is that the most important thing? I mean, do you want your house in good condition so that you can operate from it so you have a refuge to go to at the end of the day? Do you want to, do you need lots of food from your land because you just lost your job and, and don't have a, another way to get it? 
Do you want to be able to have big parties with friends? Do you want to have time for kayaking or hiking or some of these other things? Like what are you looking as a primary non-compromisable goal from your living situation? So this goes beyond, I want to buy land and start a business. This goes to your lifestyle goal. And, you know, this is something that we didn't, really talk through. In fact, we moved here as, we didn't even plan to move here when we moved here. We we planned to come here on the weekends and we didn't really need it to be in that good of shape because it was like, uh, it was like yuppie camping. I was like, sweet, we got something with an actual building on it instead of just, you know, throwing the tent up in the woods that we were going to buy a piece of land for just, you know, setting up a, a nice camping area. So, so when we moved here, Um, The reason we moved here was that we found living in the country way nicer than living in the city, but we didn't then talk about, okay, so we're moving to the country. What do we want to get out of this lifestyle? And and because we didn't do that, we set things up in our first couple years to turn into a frantic sprint rather than allowing or building in time to enjoy each other, to enjoy the recreation of the area, which is what attracted us to this area to begin with. Uh, I didn't realize how important it was to me to have a house with light in it, you know, like natural light. So some of those things are really important. Um, You know, when we moved here, I didn't have a bathtub that worked. We had to carry pots of water from the kitchen sink to the bathroom because the plumbing was so messed up, it wouldn't deliver water to the bathroom. So maybe I could have waited a little longer and fixed that before coming out, but it took me two months to figure out what was going on, right? Okay, so that's, that's you know, so true priority. It turns out it's important to me to have hot running water in the house. I can live without it if I have to, but I rather like it. And so you really want to go through what do you need, what do you really need housing-wise to be happy? Is it a big kitchen that you can can in? Is it your own space to record a podcast in? Is it just something with lots of natural light? It could be it could be anything. Something really co- to- cozy and warm. Okay, and then what about animals? Do you already have animals? A lot of people do. A lot of people have animals before they move out. We moved out here with, with some cats that had to relocate from the city. And we had to think about that because we have coyotes out here. And it's a sad day when you move your pet out and you lose your pet. Well, and other people are, you know, you're moving your herd of goats from one place to another. Like what needs to be in place for that? Or are there animals already there? We moved in and inherited two new cats and a duck. We named the duck Borax. We didn't know anything about ducks. We didn't think about it. We just had somebody feed her while we were getting the property ready. And you know what? A coyote got her. And if I would have just like thought about it for a minute, I would have realized there's a way to close them in at night. And and she was super friendly. So I could have totally done that. But somebody had just moved her down here because she was not getting along with the other ducks on the other property that she came from. Another thing you'll want to think about is uh, how's the dirt and land and does it need work? Are you going to plant, plant, you know, four fields of corn and soybeans <laughs> or whatever without looking at the soil first? Again, don't do everything at once. You might spend your whole first year just making sure that your housing is in order and your soil is getting ready for a really great second year. What's the climate really like where you are? I moved to Tennessee from Oregon and Planting happens on a completely different schedule. So I should have gotten to know some people in the area that could have shared with me the timing of when to put things down rather than spending, you know, three years figuring out when tomatoes go in the ground. One year I put them in way too late, although those did did the best out of all the mistakes. And one time I put them in way too early and they got frozen out and then I had to put a second round in way too late. So If you move to a new area that's a different climate, and this can be, you know, I think the difference between Nashville and here, which is only an hour drive, is five degrees. It's usually five degrees cooler here, uh, except for in the winter where it's five degrees colder there. You know, you want to learn your specific area and finding another farmer or gardener, great way to do it. So as you can tell, you may end up with this list that's a mile long. Just find the top three things. Once you get that list, top three things, and do those three things without getting into 
any of the other mess. And then uh, the caveat is if something living depends on you and is not on the list, they need to be on the list. So, you know, if you're, if you're taking care of goats, then obviously you need to make sure their infrastructure and all of that is ready. And as we know, when you're transitioning to becoming a farmer, hobby farmer, homesteader, sometimes the animal projects take precedence over your housing of yourself. But I, the thing I really wish we'd done differently here in that first year is just concentrated 100% on making our housing situation right. Because when we moved here, I was like, it'll take us two years to get everything updated. It'll be great. It's 10 years later. My house is not done yet. Just FYI. Anyway, number three, don't ask, underestimate. And that story feeds into this really well. That was a happy accident. I can tell you so many stories of projects we started and I had carefully calculated how much it would cost. I had saved the money. I had outsourced work or, you know, sometimes we do our own. It just depends on if we have the skills and, and, or if we want to learn the skills. Gotten into the project and something happened that made it cost twice as much. So our new rule here is we plan twice as much time and we plan twice as much money for anything we get into. Uh, The most memorable one was when I actually moved us out of the house into our guest cabin, which is small and very tight for us to live in, and was gonna pay somebody for two weeks, and I was helping them, and Mark was helping them, to remodel the whole inside of the house so it was nice in here. Half of my house is remodeled as a result of that. The reason? The reason is they found something that was expensive to fix, that had to be fixed. I'm glad we found it and fixed it. Like the house is a better house because of it, but it ate up all the resources and I had nothing extra. I couldn't finish the job. So we just got it as far as we could get it. If To this day, if you come visit me, you'll see my kitchen floor. That did not get done. I'm, I'm wondering if it'll ever get done at this rate, but there you go. So don't underestimate what projects will take. And that's, that's why I, having that priority is so important so that you can do one at a time and you don't start seven things like I did and have none of them done. I mean, so when we got into remodeling the cabin, I had it all figured out. It's going to cost about $7,000 and take two months. And five years later, we finally had our guest cabin done. I have no idea how much total I spent on it. I could go figure that out. I have spreadsheets. And it's, as I said, that all that resource was put down there instead of up here. Now, the guest cabin's great. It's nicer than my house at this point, as far as that goes. But, and it's nice to have that rental resource. I mean, we do rent out to vacation renters who want to go to the lake here or who want to see what it's like to be on a on a messy homestead. <laughs> um, we rent it out and we're getting income off it. So that is nice because it's feeding one of our priorities, which is more local income. But we probably had, we just done one thing at a time, would have gotten it done on the same timeline and had a lot less headache. The chickens, uh, like that was great. I wasn't even living, like we moved here and then I was sent for six months to Houston, Texas for a project. So I worked from Houston, came home once a month. And one of those times we're sitting around talking, we're like, hey, let's let's raise baby chickens. So I go back to Houston. I had lots of time after hours on my hands there because I wasn't on the homestead doing stuff and ordered the chickens to arrive the week after I got back and figured we'd just figure the, the rest out, right? Got a heating lamp. I'll make the brooder. This is me underestimating my ability to run power tools, by the way. Got home, super tired from the drive. And ended up home a week later than expected. So I got home on like a Friday and on Sunday morning I got the call and I had to go get the chickens. And they ended up in a cardboard box with a brooder lamp that wasn't big enough for them. I did have the watering and the food. And I had bought this cute little bag of food. It was really cute. It lasted about a day and a half. So that whole season of raising chickens, and I had 25 birds, um, it went, it was basically, we were building things right after they were ready for them until we discovered that pre-made coop that actually really helped us. But that was not the best way to do it. It would have been better for me to 
hold my horses a little bit and just focus on the house and on getting, you know, the garden up and running and some of those and the pump house. Whew, the pump house was a mess, man. Okay, so you live in the country, right? And it's, you know, ah, it's not that far. It's like 12 miles to the nearest city. There are plumbers who live in that city. I call them and I'll say, hey, I have a plumbing project. Want to come out? Where is it? Nope, I'm not driving that far. Or that'll be 25 bucks extra, man, for me to drive that far. If I get there and there's nothing wrong, and by the way, you can rest assured if I'm calling a plumber, there is something majorly wrong. One guy has stopped working for me because he said, every time you call me, it's a nightmare because you haven't been able to figure it out. Therefore, it's really bad. Well, when we first got here, we couldn't figure out why we had no water pressure. And the first thing I discovered was rocks. There was like a whole bunch of sediment and rocks in our um, in our pipes in the house. So I blew those out, got that put back together, managed to fix everything but the bathtub, which took longer. And that was a huge boon, but it still wasn't very good water pressure. So I go down to the pump house because I can't get a plumber to come out. Because, oh, by the way, in a pump house, you need a plumber who's also an electrician because you have power and you have water. So I get down there and I look at the pipes and they're PVC, except for this one place that has two hose clamps and a radiator hose. So they had repaired a cracked pipe with hose clamps and a radiator hose that they had sitting around. So part of the problem was <clears throat> hard to maintain pressure when your pipes are, well, a radiator hose, guys. So I fixed that, glued everything back together. And this this started a long series of me getting 60 PSI in the face. So turned it on and it held. I was successful at plumbing. I was super excited. And the minute... I did that probably 60 seconds in all of a sudden something hits me in the face from another pipe that broke because a lot of the PVC pipes had not been glued properly. So I went through probably four weeks of troubleshooting that and we had everything working. We still weren't quite living there yet. And one time Mark and I were on a business trip and we came back. We were driving past the hauler on our way to Nashville and we decided to stop and just check on it because it's you know close enough to the freeway on the way home. We drive up and I hear the pump running in the pump house and I, it is just running like, like a faucet's open somewhere. So I turned off everything and uh, looked around, didn't see that any fa faucets were open. I kind of called my dad and he's like, well, that's why you should turn your water off when you're not there because if anything goes wrong, you're just going to burn out your pump. So luckily, you know, this was the first time we did not burn out our pump. Came back that weekend, turned it on, like cistern was full. It was all perfect. All of a sudden, there's no water at the house, like 20 minutes later. And I'm like, what? I go down, cistern's empty. I haven't had water on. I go around the whole property looking for leaks. Nothing. And then I look at the lawn. And we were in the middle of a drought. And there was this really green place on the lawn. And I was like, dig there. And so we dug there and we ended up with this geyser of water coming out of our lawn. And it turned out the pipe was so old, like once I got the pressure into it, the increased pressure in the underground pipes caused that to, to break. And when they had put the pipes in, they had just sort of put them in the dirt and not thought about <clears throat> what's under the pipes. And we have sharp rocks here and rocks had come up and there were multiple cuts in that pipe. So that was like a whole nother project that was born from a pro. So you see how this can cascade. If my priorities had been get the house in order and fix the plumbing the first year and get heat in the house, those would have been great first priorities. But instead I built a pig pit and I added chickens and I started canning all my own food. And Mark and I didn't get to go out and have very much fun that first year, by the way. So Anyway, don't underestimate what things will take. I originally thought plumbing would be the, you know, a matter of blowing out some pipes, putting some new fixtures in that project. I think when all was said and done, it took me three years to get the, the pump house totally in order. Now, luckily in between, like I eventually realized you just can't work all the time. So it worked well for us. I would say that in hindsight, I should have taken a little more time that first year to think about the priorities and then work on them. So those are the three mistakes you should avoid with your land. Don't rush in. Don't do everything at once. 
and don't underestimate how long things take. If you do that, like plan double resources and it goes well, you end up with extra resources for your next project. So that's kind of cool. Now, what does this mean you should do on the way in? I mean, you can take these and just go the opposite. Take time to observe. Observe your property, observe your buildings, like look at everything, get to know it really well. Set clear priorities with your big picture goal in mind and stick to them. And this is when you need to be really honest with your family and they need to be honest with you. If, you know, like Mark really likes to have a place to go swimming that he can walk to. We basically can't buy land without that. I mean, we could, but he won't be super happy. So he loves going down to the creek and going for a plunge when he's been out in the yard. So that's that's a very clear priority. It's a simple lifestyle thing, but it's pretty easy to find a way to support that, right? Or, and then double your estimate in time and money for everything you have enough, re so that you have enough resources to complete them. If you do those three things and don't do the other three things that I told you about, your first year will be way better than our first couple years were. Okay, on to our next segment, Stories from the Holler. This is where we share what really happens, for better or worse, on the homestead. And this is a bit of a holler update. We did a bunch of stuff last week. And part of it's because I'm getting ready for a coffee roasting workshop I'm doing down at Jack Spierko's place, which is near Dallas, Texas. Uh, Jack Spierko does a great podcast called The Survival Podcast. His tagline is helping you to live a better life if times get tough or if even if they don't. So he came, I, I found him because I was canning some vegetables and he had a podcast that was titled Seven Wild Plants You Should Have in Your Yard. And I thought, well, that'll be interesting. This is about an hour. My hands will be all mucked up and I won't have to like keep hitting play like I have to do with the Cato Institute short podcasts. So yeah, we'll listen to that. And as I got to listening, I realized that this per I would have never like listen to something called the survival podcast at that time. I, I wouldn't have thought about it because I don't see living in the country or living, developing self-reliance in your life as um, prepping or survivalism. But as it turns out, it, it kind of is. It's just that the brand of prepping is so like weird guys with guns and you know what it is. Like they're not super attractive to me. But as I, as I started listening to this guy, he really interesting. Oh, he's a, a he's a good talent, entertaining, um, had, tends to have anarchistic leanings. Um, well, it turns out he is one, but at first it was just leanings when I was listening because I wasn't listening very carefully. He does a history segment that's pretty cool that somebody else provides for him. And then he knows a ton about animals and plants and gardening and all of these things that I'm really interested in. So um, I got the opportunity to pitch an idea to do a workshop session at an event. He, he has two events a year and his events are oriented towards teaching people like all of these things like beekeeping and uh, you know, how to prepare economically in your life, like all these other things that you can prepare for. And I said, well, hey, I'm a coffee roaster. I'd love to not only teach your people how to roast coffee on the homestead without buying any special equipment, but also how they can turn it into a cottage business. Because as you know, we've been marketing holler roast here for a few years, although I've just gotten serious about it in the last couple months. It's It's been in the plan, but I didn't want to pull the trigger till I was ready to support the order. So, so because like roasting coffee, the whole process is fairly easy. It's just time. And then like, what are you going to do in front of people while you're sitting there waiting for the beans to roast, right? So I thought, well, we'll talk about what the revenue possibilities are, what to look for in your market. Is it oversaturated? Is it not saturated enough? Those sorts of things. And he said, yes. So in about a week and a half, I'm going to Dallas and, and doing that. And that means I'm going to be gone for five days in the middle of getting the land ready. So we lucked into five giant truckloads of wood chips from the electric company last week. And I just said, you know, like, fit as many here as you can, man. We will take as many wood chips as you can. I cleared them an area out near the road so they didn't have to maneuver their big trucks up here. And 
Mark and I had some trade with a client who advertises in the paper and we rented a piece of equipment and we took on the infamous stepped retaining wall. You may wonder why the retaining wall is there. When I moved into this house, this house is built into the side of a hill and water comes in when it rains. But I didn't know that when I bought it because on one side there's there's a buffer area. On the other side, the buffer area had failed. And so I paid a guy to hand dig and put in a French drain. I did not watch him carefully enough. He put the French drain too high. And so it was like water was collecting and then draining into my wall. This is what came up when I was doing that remodel. It turned out that the whole west side of my house was rotting because of that. Luckily, it's a cinder block house, so the cinder blocks were fine. The wood touching the cinder blocks were not, so we had to gut that whole side and build a new internal wall as well. The way that Mr. Cruz built my house, he put a little gap between the outer wall and the floor, so my floor was not rotted. I was very, very lucky, but they had to redo the whole thing, and then we also had to redo the French drain, so we rented heavy equipment for a whole week, dug down below the footer, put in the gravel, put in the tile, put in, you know, filled it back in and that, then they left. And my house is built into the side of a hill and I'm looking at the hill and every week the hill is getting closer to the house again. And I'm like, okay, all that dirt is going to end up back in this French drain. It's going to be clogged up and I'm going to have a problem again. So I ended up getting some railroad ties, um, hiring some help to help us then put in a retaining wall. And to do that, again, heavy equipment was rented. I should have totally done this when I did the French drain. And they put in the railroad ties because that's what I could afford. Well, this is where I made a mistake. The contractor working on it said, hey, it would look really nice if we just sort of step up and back with these rather than just do one big wall. And it would look really cool if it wasn't a weed attracting clay, horrible mess, which is what has been for six years. And like, we just weed whack it in frustration because I can't get anything to grow there. And so with all these wood chips, what Mark and I did this weekend was go through and clear everything out, put really thick cardboard down because we want what's there to just die. And then we piled a bunch of wood chips on them. Now I didn't add nutrient there. If I would have, I guess if I would have done it, you know, even more right, I would have put a bunch of manure down. But my goal right now is inhibit the weed growth and start fostering some fertility. And these wood chips, when they break down, will become a really nice mulch. And we put like 10 inches of wood chips on there. And I am prepared to put a lot more. So that was really cool. And that kind of gives me a leg up going into this workshop in Dallas because I'll be gone for a week, but at least that one thing is done. And I have wood chips piled all over the property. I have them ready to go in the garden when we need to do the, the pathways and the beds. I have them above the garden so that later in the year I'll have compost from that. I have them in other areas of the property where I use them, like down by the duck coop and in front of the cabin. Like we've got wood chips everywhere. We've I think we probably went through a little over three quarters of the wood chips at the bottom. And in fact, if the electric company comes back with more, which I hope they do, they're going to find they have lots more room. Anyway, last thing I want to share with you on the stories from the holler segment is daylight savings time. That's right. We all lost an hour this weekend, didn't we? Do you know what daylight savings time is like on a homestead? Well, now my ducks now get up at 930 instead of 830 because I'm not going to make them change time. I I let them out of their coop at 930 now. It was 830 so that they will have laid their morning eggs before they leave so that I can find their eggs because otherwise it becomes a duck egg hunt in the yard. So nothing's changed for them. Same with the chickens. And they go to bed at the same time. They're very light oriented. So the sun goes down, they go to bed. Nothing's changed. One thing's changed for me though. And that is, in fact, I'm getting up at the same time. The thing that's changed for me is I am now, by definition of people who work in the U.S. time, I'm getting up an hour later than I was. And they're expecting me to be places an hour earlier. In fact, this podcast right now, it's two o'clock. I'm still recording it. I would be done by now, most, you know, had, had we stayed on normal time. 
now being relative to what now is then. Um, so daylight savings time on a farm is kind of a ruse. It's, it makes me kind of grumpy. I, I, you know, I don't care if we stay on this time or the other time, but it'd sure be nice to stick with one because nothing changes here, but everything changes appointment wise elsewhere. And I end up places earlier than I was before. Like I'm going to choir tonight earlier than I was before, which means there's more light. And that's awesome, right? No, I'm just wasting a bunch of light. Like I want to go sing in choir after dark because I can't work in the yard after dark very easily. And so, yeah, daylight savings time makes me pretty grumpy. Okay, last but not least, we're going to go into the final segment. And that is chapter eight of Toby Hemingway's Gaia's Garden. Great book. If you haven't really thought about permaculture much and are just getting into this as a concept or regenerative agriculture, as my marketing friendly friends like to call it, uh, this is a great book to read. Now, I bought a horrible book that I recommend you never buy. In fact, I'll put that in the show notes, the Don't Buy It book. Um, but chapter eight took me a few weeks to just think about because it was all about plant guilds and um, polyculture and planting things together that help each other. So what I learned in this chapter was the difference between interplanting versus companion planting versus plant community. So interplanting is when you just put plants near each other and don't worry about if they're beneficial to each other, but just so you have some variety and like you might use one to shade another, but you're not thinking, okay, does an onion go next to a cabbage? Well, okay. And that's something people have done for years. Companion planting is a method, and that's a method I've used for a long time, where you put plants that are supposed to be complementary to each other. An example of this is putting marigolds in your garden to deter pests from coming in. And apparently there's some mixed research on if that works. I love putting marigolds in my garden. They look pretty and... If they help deter pests, that's great. I I always say these natural methods of deterring pests in the South are just like a different scale than what works in the Northwest where I'm from originally. And then there's plant communities. Plant communities are plants that work together and depend on each other. And it's not a static thing. It's a dynamic thing. So there's things coming and going at different times of year. In, in, in companion planting, you'll probably put everything in the ground at one time and let them be near each other and help each other. Uh, but plant communities or plant guilds or plants, you know, like you might have one that's pulling nitrogen out of the ground and then letting its leaves fall and feeding another one that is actually providing shade for the plant that's, you know, so they have multiple functions. And we talked about functions earlier in the book. Uh, the term polyculture came up, which is... The two examples they gave were garden oriented. So the idea being you plant densely a variety of plants that come on at different times. And so the, it was, you, you start your cabbages in the greenhouse, you go out and you seed your lettuces and your radishes in the garden. And then in about four weeks, you pull radishes out because you're eating radishes and you thin your lettuce. And then you put the cabbage and broccoli starts in the holes created by the by the radishes and then after that's done and you're pulling you know heads of lettuce out those leaf spaces opens you can seed your beans there because the soil is warmer so you see how this goes right the idea with polyculture is your your succession planting as space is created and the concept here is to keep things coming in that you do want so you don't have things come in that you don't want like weeds Now, none of this deals with my Johnson grass problem. Only I can deal with that. But it is, it's interesting to think of it that way. I've sort of been naturally doing that anyway, although I do tend to group my tomatoes near each other. I don't put them all over the place just because I can't keep up on that. Uh, The thing I noticed as I was reading about polyculture, there's a couple examples in the book. um, One not from the Northwest, one from the Pacific Northwest. What works timing-wise in the Pacific Northwest is not going to be the same in Tennessee, not unless you make some changes. And that's because our last frost date is like minutes before our really hot weather hits. So 
like right now, right? It's 21 degrees, but it's been 70s and 80s going into it. I should already have my lettuce out and my cabbages and all of those things, except for now it's 21, which can kill some of that stuff. So I say this, row cover is your friend if you're going to try some of these methods, especially with the examples in the book, or go figure out what works well in your area and try some of your own polyculture concepts. I mean, really the concept is put stuff in, it grows, you pull it out, other things go in to fill that space. It, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple concept. And of course, they brought up the three sisters example. And I didn't know this, but there's a fourth sister. Did you know that? Apparently, the Anastasi Indians planted Rocky Mountain bee plant with it, which is a flowering plant that leaves edible pods when it's done. And the plant attracts bees. So think about how awesome that is, right? So the three sisters, you make a big mound, you plant corn. About two weeks later, you come back through and you put your bean seeds in the ground. Then when those come up, you come back and you put squash in between the mounds. So the idea is the squash leaves are big. And you do a vining squash, by the way, not a, not a zucchini. Leaves are big and they shade the ground and keep it kind of cool and stable and also keep other weeds from growing. The bean climbs the stalk of the corn and then the corn gives you corn. And in research, they've found out that the roots of the corn are releasing sugars that are good for the other plants. So these are plants that work together in community. Well, add a bee attracting plant to that and now you have pollination. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It makes me want to try it again because I've totally failed at Three Sisters several times. I've made all the mistakes you can make. And this is just because those stupid how-to articles on the internet, by the way, are incomplete. I swear that people who write those haven't actually tried anything themselves. So it was great to read about the Three Sisters again in this book because they included some important information like timing between when you plant. Because I used to plant all those things at one time and then wonder why my beans were taller than my corn. Turns out you should plant your corn, I mean your beans, after the corn has gotten to uh, a certain height. Anyway, questions to ask yourself about this chapter. What one community do I want to set up this year? If, if you're new to this whole idea, like where can you really concentrate your effort and what are you going to do? How can I make plants, insects, soil, organism, birds, and mammals work in concert on my land? And by the way, guys, you're a mammal too, right? How are you involved in that whole cycle? Where can I try out polyculture in my garden this year? And what succession will I aim for? I mean, that's something I'm asking myself. Like, huh, which bed do I want to try some of these in? I mean, I'm sort of doing it anyway, but... Like, do I, what, where would I try a, a test? And do I have time each day to oversee a succession planning project? So in polyculture, you need to look at your garden every day because things change every day and it may be time to do the succession planting. You don't want to miss that. And with that, remember, if you like the show, you can support us while drinking a marvelous cup of hand-roasted coffee. That's right. Holler Roast Coffee is now available for sale at livingfreeintennessee.com. Just go there and click on coffee. You can order it by the pound. The best deal is actually five pounds. It fits in a flat rate shipping box. So that is your best shipping rate. Or if you want to do local pickup, I can meet you in Cookville, Smithville. We are at not enough time in Smithville if you want to drop in there and pick some up as well. And if you want to send me a question, topic, idea, or comment, feel free to email me again at nicolesauce at gmail.com. For those of you who prefer YouTube to listen to podcasts, I don't know why you do that, but you do. You must be sitting at your desks. Uh, we have 25 followers. Woohoo! I need to get 100 to get a vanity domain. So I've dropped the link to that. Even if you don't really like YouTube all that much, like head over there and follow my channel because when I get to 100, I can have a forward slash live TN or whatever. Anyway, we've got a lot, gotten a lot done this week in the Holler Homestead. And it's funny how simplifying your life and putting more energy into gleaning a living from a piece of land when done well can add resilience to your household. Next week, we'll talk about resilience, the resilience result that comes from homesteading a bit. And I will share with you a big change that's happened in my job. I'm so glad to see spring springing here in Tennessee, along with its new plants. It's snow. It's 70 degree days, followed by 21 degree nights. And more visits from friends. I've had a weekly visit from a new friend. It's really fun to see her pop in. 
Living this way is really fun. And it's really hard. Sometimes it's kind of scary, honestly. But it's always rewarding to know that we've made what we have with our own tuned hands. And with that, my friends, go out and make it a great week. Ah uh-huh.